This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today on the show, I have Russell Napier. Russell is a consultant with CLSA, who I had the good fortune to speak for last year in 2013 in several cities in Asia. Russell is a global macro strategist. He definitely comes at it from a different trading perspective than I do with trend following. However, from a big picture economic standpoint, I love the fact that he's questioning things. He's saying, hey, this isn't okay. It's not okay that we've all ascribed the few men at a few central banks, the few men and a few women at a few central banks to somehow or another manage all of the variables in our life and they will take care of the economy. Russell's book is called Anatomy of the Bear. It's worth checking out. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Hello, Michael. Hey, Russell. I think we, we broke through. We, we finally speak. I have to go and find somewhere quiet, which I can speak to, but that's really taking me a little bit of time. Yeah, I don't There's know. Square, for what, up, square up ahead, yeah. For whatever reason, the NSA did not want this call to happen today. Sorry, say that again? I said, for whatever reason, the NSA did not want this call to happen today. <laughs> You know, I, you know, I've had these issues before. It's never been your NSA. It's been more uh, government of Malaysia in my case. But anyway. Well, um, so where, where am I find you today? Where are you at right now? Well, I live just outside Edinburgh. Uh, I live here, but I'm not here very often. Okay. So I'm just standing, I don't know if I've been to Edinburgh. I'm standing in the middle of the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. Ah, Okay. Well, let, let me give you let me give you the warm up. Let me give you the warm up question. You got a lot of experience. You got a lot of different perspectives on what's going on in the world from a macro perspective. Why why should the average person out there assume that they are never going to see uh, an interest rate for their savings again in their lifetime, or should they? No, they never will, uh, because uh, the first thing you have to ab- uh, abolish is a belief that there'll ever be a free market in, in, in interest rates again. So obviously, there's ne- never a free market at the short end. Anyway, the the, uh, the state for the central bank sets those rates, but they're not in the business of controlling the whole yield curve. So uh, I think we've just come out of a 20, 30 year decade where you see market forces set prices. Uh, in a world where the um, state can set prices, we've been here before, of course. I mean, obviously during World War II, uh, the American government and the central bank set the entire length of the yield curve, and they maintained. I mean, they manipulated the entire yield curve until 1952 directly, and one could argue indirectly for many decades after that. So we just entered this world where there doesn't have to be a relationship between inflation and market-determined interest rates, and therefore interest rates can stay below inflation for a prolonged time. And in answer to your question, that's obviously the problem we all have as savers. Yeah, and I mean, it's essentially the choice. The choice is being made for us. You will put your money into equities no matter what and just wait for something to happen. And so far, it's been something. So far, it's been something good, though, right? I mean, it's gone up. Yeah, well, I think it's. I think it's kind of worse than that, actually, because it's uh, what they're doing under the guise of regulation. I mean, you and I, we're not institutions. You and I are free to put my, our money wherever I want. And as you say, because I set it up this way, you and I are being basically told to buy it, buy equities. But there are lots of people who hold savings on our behalf who, who are not. Uh, I mean, there's lots of people who are being regulated into holding this government debt. Uh, you're being less in inflation. So under the guise of macro prudential regulation, we are asking our banks to hold what are called unencumbered liquid securities, which is a code word for government debt. Uh, and under the guise of regulating our insurance companies, we're forcing them to own more government debt. So it's only because we aren't living here in institutions that we get, at least, at least we get the flexibility of buying equities. But these other guys, the regulators, are really forcing them into the debt markets, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not optimistic on equities, as you, as you might know, but uh, at least in the long run, they'll be fine. Uh, debt could spend uh, three decades providing very poor returns. Let me jump back to something you brought up right there at the beginning, the idea of free market capitalism. And maybe our entire conversation is about this, because there are, there are huge numbers of people looking at America, and they still use this phrase capitalism like they think that's what we're working under. And, and, and 
where did we go off the rails, so to speak? And, and, and why do you see how we can never get back on the rails? We, and, and, the, and it's even more delusional that the general public really thinks that we are in this just free market capitalism world. Yeah, well, I mean, you write a whole book about that, so I'll do my very best to try and cover that in, in one question. Of course, I mean, basically, if you're looking for unadulterated free market capitalism, you have to go to the 19th century. As democracies, we turned our face on that, and we decided to have some controls. I mean, actually, Teddy Roosevelt, you could argue, began this. The Industry of Commerce Commission was in 1893, even before Roosevelt. So even in the late 19th century, we, we were concluding that untrammeled free markets were not a good thing. Uh, and as a society, we have decided to move along the spectrum. That's how far you move along the spectrum, which is obviously the key issue here. The uh, Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, went to one extreme of that. But all of us have moved for 100 years or more along the spectrum away from untrammeled free market capitalism. In terms of where we are today and why that's being accelerated, that, that is entirely due to the fact that, we're, that, that the whole place is over indebted. So the need to make all these changes, the need to create away our debt, is enforcing all these government rules and government restrictions. So I think it's kind of a normal place you'd be in when you have too much debt, because if you can't inflate away your debt, then people have to go bankrupt, or even states have to go bankrupt. And the democratic process is not keen on permitting people uh, to go bankrupt. So there is no simple question, you know, when did we reach a tipping point that we went too far? I would argue it was actually not having enough regulation. Not having enough regulation. Let us get into a situation of far, far too much debt in both the private and public sector. And now getting rid of that debt uh, is why we've taken a, you know, a major, major step away from a more free market system. So it's, you know, there is no simple answer to that. But it's not simply a free market capitalism good state bad. If the state had been doing a better job, we wouldn't be as massively embedded both in private and public as we are today. And when I want to say the state, I mean the regulator. We should never have been, we should never have got here. And that, so that, I would be in favor of regulation. I would be against Green Fund. He said, don't regulate them. Uh, the reason we're here is they didn't regulate them. We married the too much debt, and this is the natural way you get rid of debt. Uh, in a democracy. It's not been very successful, I would say, but anyway, that's a separate issue. You know, here you are. You're you're giving a lot of big picture macro views. You're really breaking issues down. And people can go check people can go check out your book for even more of the anatomy of a, of the bear. But when you when you have all these big macro issues, at the end of the day, it's individuals listening. Individuals listening to your insights, individuals listening to our podcast episode. At the end of the day though, it doesn't it it's really becoming an every man for himself situation because if you trust the system, you're going to get what the system dictates. So ultimately, it's 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 us individuals against whatever the system is laying out. Well, my God, that's true. And of course, at the minute, we have a we don't have to be in any system. At the minute, uh, certainly most people listening to to you will have the freedom to put their money anywhere in the world. Uh, they can take the money out of the United States and put it anywhere in the world. Now there is no system which is running 19th century capitalism. And, you know, even if there was, it's not necessarily a good place to put your money because you could be overvalued there than you'd be overvalued anywhere else. Sure. Uh, if you're looking for wealth preservation, however, so that's not actually really making very much money. It's just holding on to what you've got. I mean, I've personally recommended for quite a long period of time that people invest money in the bonds of the government of Singapore. And nobody in the right mind would refer to the government of Singapore as endorsing free market capitalism. But the reason that I'm interested in owning the debt of the government of Singapore is the country which doesn't have a lot of debt compared to its assets. It's one of the few governments in the world which has been run in balance sheet with a high, a high degree of prudence. And therefore, I think it's a place where you should be able to maintain the value of your capital. They will not need to take it off here. Uh, you're not a citizen anyway. They won't need to take your money, number one. They don't want to be deflated in a way because they haven't got a lot of debt, number two. So we do live in an extreme situation. Well, I believe we're just actually holding on to your capital in real terms will be an achievement. And there are people who think that Norway is in this situation, an under-indebted government with lots of assets, and that will be a safe place to protect your, 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 your money. Uh, but it's not really about ideologically where they are on the scale. It's about how much debt they have. People with too much debt uh, will basically come after your money in one way or another. And people who don't have a lot of debt don't have to do that. And they can be ideologically opposed. But if you look at that issue of debt before you look at the issue of uh, they're in, they're internal so Russell, inflation, deflation, it's the debate that's held nonstop. But I know you come from the perspective that you really, we, you think we're either in the middle of or on the eve of a major deflationary shock. What are you seeing from a big macro perspective that points towards deflation? 
Okay. I mean, it's, first of all, it's a minority here, and it's a very hard one to argue because most people, uh, very who live in cities, in the United States, just see input. So let me begin where, the, where it's beginning, and it's beginning outside of the United States of America, uh, and it's beginning in the emerging markets. Uh, if we look at the post Lehman Brothers world, most of the growth in the world has come from emerging markets. It hasn't come from the United States or Europe or the United Kingdom. Or but that is slowing very rapidly, and uh, any of your listeners who... <laughs> Look at the news headlines today. We'll see just how rapidly it's happening in Argentina, Turkey, uh, the Ukraine, and I'd argue even in China now. Uh, so that real interim of global growth is coming down. And a deflation argument is a very simple argument. It's saying too much supply, not enough demand. And the big providers of marginal demand in the world, I think, are coming off very quickly. Now, I know that those will argue that demand in America is picking up very rapidly, and that will more than offset this. So I, I question that. I don't doubt for a moment that the American economy is growing. I don't think it's going with very strong demand. Europe is certainly not going with very strong demand. As we put all those bits together, that great engineering of growth from emerging markets slowing rapidly. Uh, no growth, I think, yet in Europe. Tepid growth, I believe, in the United States of America. After five years, or almost five years, the anniversary is coming up in just the next two months. Five years of extreme monetary policy. We're still looking at a situation where we haven't got more demand and supply. We're still looking at a situation we're going to have more supply and demand. And just finally, one important issue on that, it's Japan. Japan has been given license to depreciate its exchange rate and take market share. So what that involves is the, uh, cutting the selling price of its products. So Japan is selling products much more cheaply around the world, uh, and that's a key source of deflation. There are many others, but you can see it in commodity prices, but they're all linked really back into emerging markets or the fall in the value of the yen. So the deflation that's coming is coming from outside of the United States of America. Uh, but I believe it's coming anyway. And it's going to, of course, be a huge surprise because it seems to have complete faith in our central bank just to generate inflation. I think there's significant evidence that in aggregate they are failing. You know, Russell, I'm, I'm not a macro strategist. And in my world, it's it's a slightly different world. But it just as an observation, and living in Asia all last year and being in all the major centers, the major cities all across eight or nine countries, it was always amazing to me that every major city had a brand new a beautiful mall, but empty. And every one of these stores would have eight to 10 employees in the stores running around in circles doing nothing. And that's not a criticism of Asia. I love the, I love the continent. I love what's going on there. But to me, I would see these, this, I kept saying to myself, who's paying the bills to turn the lights on? Yeah. My God, it's 25 years I've been covering it. It's 25 years in this business. And the thing that always amazes me is how much time you spend forecasting demand and how little time we spend forecasting supply. Now, you know, in the business of returns, and, you know, for forecasting returns, we better do both. So you look at emerging markets, you see the growth, and you well, the growth is there, we must be going to make a lot of money. But what you really see very clearly is supply is expanding very rapidly. Indeed, you saw that with your own eyes. Uh, you'll have seen lots of the horror stories about China. And there's too much supply. Now, that tells me that what's happening is that we live in a world with too much savings, and the savings producing too much capacity and demand isn't keeping up. And there's not enough focus on that supply side of things. But yeah, I'm throwing you from the middle of Edinburgh. I don't have to walk very far from the heart of Edinburgh to find lots of uh, lots of empty shops around here because demand is not kept up with the supply side. So it's a, it's sort of a global phenomenon. In some places, it's worse than others. But the idea that uh, emerging markets are just a great source of demand going forward is really pretty foolish. Uh, when you go out there and you see some of the supply that's coming out of that region and, you know, last two decades of my life has been about supply from China. And if I only focus on demand from China, I'd be wrong on just about everything. You know, Russell, when you, we talk about demand, we talk about supply, but ultimately it does come down to the one issue that's a commonality over hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, would be the madness of the crowd, the human, the, the human behavior, irrational human behavior. Ultimately, isn't it all rooted right there? I, I, my Lord. When you're trying to work out the value of anything, you're just looking at the behavior of a crowd of people. I can't think of anything on this planet which we as human beings describe a value to, which is an ultimately an expression of something which is going on in our brains rather than ultimately supply and demand. Uh, apropos what we all do for a living, it's most obvious in financial markets when you get trend falling behavior. Uh, you know, we all know that you should be buying your stocks from a bottom up perspective. We all know that one, what Warren Buffett says is pretty much what you should do, and yet very few of us do it. Uh, and we all do get caught up in crowd-following behavior. But sometimes the crowd becomes bigger than the fundamentalists. That might be a better way of putting it. It doesn't happen every day. It doesn't happen every year. 
uh, I think it's very clear that's what's happening today, though, that the people who are trend following the market's going up because it's going up, therefore I should be involved in it. That has become a big cry uh, compared to the fundamentalists. I spend time with investors, with uh, the value investors, the growth investors. It's something that's very difficult to find anything to buy. So in terms of that madness of crowd issues, uh, no one has yet managed to put anything entirely objective on this. It will be a subjective issue. Uh, but when you have a market full of trend followers, well, the trend can change pretty quickly. Uh, and we all know what happens next. This is not a market which is being dominated by investors who believe they're getting value in the market. And therefore, I think it's a dangerous market. Well, there's, there's, uh, you know, you keep seeing the, uh, the statistics on margin debt. There's, there's no shortage of, there's no shortage of people that believe that a little extra juice won't produce a little extra return. And, um, you can see that in the numbers. Yeah. But if you, so if you believe that the central bankers will not fade away the debt, then you borrow, don't you? I mean, if we're saying that inflation is bad for people who lend money, it's going to be good for people who borrow money. So the general conclusion is with this in mind, the so-called printing of money, you take on debt. Uh, but as we've been discussing, you see lots and lots of evidence that that so-called printing of money is not actually leading into inflation. So there's a very nasty surprise coming for people who have loaded up on the debt, uh, expecting it to be inflated away. But that's exactly the dynamic that's going on. The debt, the equities are a one-way position on the upside. People buying money believe that as long as you get inflation, then it's also a one-way bet to inflate away those debts. And I think there's a nasty surprise on its, on its way. Certainly a very nasty surprise if you're living in Argentina, Ukraine, uh, anywhere in the Middle East, anybody who geared up there to uh, speculate on rising asset prices is waking up to a very big shock. A, a person like yourself who comes at this from a macro perspective, you're getting behind the scenes, you're trying to look at how all the pieces work. Isn't it interesting, it's, it's noteworthy that you're going up against essentially the USA equity bull. And as long as that USA equity bull is there, you, Russell, are just a guy who's who's barking over in the corner, who cares, it doesn't make a difference. It's not until something changes that anyone ever cares about someone that's giving, hey, like, look, look, guys, let's look at this behind the scenes. What's going on? It's just so interesting how much coverage the equity bull gives to people to not listen, to not think. Yeah, of course, of course that's true. I mean, it's back to that point about a rising market. A rising market creates trend-falling behavior. Trend-falling behavior is effectively switching your brain off saying it's going up because it's going up. Uh, none of us can know when those things go up. None of us can know when those things turn to run. So I, on the whole, tend to ignore them. Not, you may think it's a wise or unwise policy, but because I can't really get to grips with the, the crowd, then why waste time trying to forecast? If we look below that, however, to the fundamentals, to the valuations, and to what's going on in the world in terms of growth in emerging markets, then it gives you great, uh, great concern. Uh, back to that main point, when the market's full of trend-following behavior, it is dangerous to be a trend follower, in my opinion, unless you believe you've got some unique insight which tells you when it's going to stop. And if that person exists, please, Michael, give me his phone number. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, look, the, the classic trend following perspective is really more of a price driven thing. It's it's really having no ability to predict uh, when it will start or when it will end. And you never get out of the bottom and you, you never get into the bottom. You never get out of the top. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a classic trend following perspective. I don't think, however, that's how most people that might be operating as a trend follower, as you describe it, or operating. I think most of these people are long and uh, they'd have no exit plan at all. They're just going to sit in there forever because they have complete faith and trust in the United States Federal Reserve. Yeah, well, it's not just, I mean, I, I think most of your listeners maybe are, are private individual investors, but I'm looking at institutions who are doing exactly the same thing. I mean, the Fed has been around, as you know, now for 100 years. There is absolutely nothing in the history of the Federal Reserve. It's just exactly In fact, there's nothing in it. History of the Federal Reserve. They were very much trusted at all. And yet here we are, uh, you know, uh, seasoned investment professionals, cynics and skeptics by, by nature, absolutely 100% trusting that this time the Federal Reserve will deliver. Well, a lot of people have got very poor over the last hundred years uh, betting on the ability of the Fed. This is not a criticism of the Fed, by the way. We may have given them an impossible job. We're asking them today, we're basically asking them to control all the variables. It's not a job which can be done. Uh, I'm not worried about people's faith in the Fed because the Fed's going to get it wrong. I think it's madness to ever have faith in the Fed to deliver on all the variables that people are ascribing to them, the ability to deliver on. It just can't be done by any set of human beings. So faith, this confidence and faith in the Fed is, is incredibly dangerous. You know, hey, let's leave it there. That was a great thought because I, I think you're right. Us as human beings 
trying to ascribe all these different variables to a, a, a few group of people, uh, to, to take care of us all is, uh, is madness in and of itself. Yeah, well, if you go out and look at it, I'm standing in the middle of a real economy here. The idea that any central bank or any government has any control, uh, I'm actually standing not too far away from the statue of Adam Smith, so maybe I'm getting inspiration from that. But the idea that there's any body of one body of men or women out there who can control all this stuff. Uh, if, you want to bet, if you want to bet on that, go ahead. But, uh, you know, that's the most dangerous bet of all. Yeah. It is true. That is true. I love it. Hey, Russell, um, I appreciate your time today. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll catch up again. Uh, we'll get you a nice, quiet office and we'll get you, uh, expanding long form, but I know you're, you're in between meetings and I just want to catch up with you, but, uh, I appreciate your time today, Russell. Okay. Cheers and good luck. Bye-bye. Our connection was not that great, but for more information on Russell, just Google him, Russell Napier. Also check out his book, Anatomy of the Bear, available on Amazon. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.